you recall having any conversation about killing Nicole, even if you didn't mean it seriously? None, absolutely none, ever. O.J. Simpson, forced to testify for the first time about his role in a brutal double murder by the grief-stricken father of one of the victims. Ron and Nicole were butchered by their client. Do any of you believe otherwise? Simpson is grilled. If she fell when she was outside, it's because you made her fall, right? No. In Fred Goldman's relentless quest to find justice for his son, Ron. We've waited a long time to have an opportunity to ask the hard questions. This time in a civil trial. You ever strike her? No. You ever hurt her? Yes. The odds were against Fred Goldman. We already knew the power of O.J. Simpson. He had unlimited resources, fame, fortune, people who adored him. Simpson had already beat the murder rap in criminal court, giving his civil lawyers a roadmap to victory. Goldman family, they weren't rich people. Fred had a real job. And the attorney chosen by the Goldman family to bring Simpson down had no experience in pursuing this kind of case. I never handled a wrongful death case. In fact, I never litigated a personal injury case. I was a business litigation lawyer. I don't think we had any comprehension of what was going to be involved. There was a mountain of evidence that showed Mr. Simpson's guilt, and you all know as well as I what that evidence is. The deposition tapes of O.J. Simpson testifying will be broadcast at length, and viewers will be able to hear Simpson try to account for his actions when challenged directly by the lawyers bringing no. the civil suit. He would lie about every important fact. A new trial. Best of luck, man. Best of luck. A new attorney. I said, you just put your fists up. Is that what you did that night? And damning new evidence. It was proof that he had the shoes on his feet that he owned them. I would have never worn those ugly ass shoes. Even with the evidence being as good as most murder cases could ever hope for, no one knew if it would be enough. Would you raise your right hand, please? You do solemnly swear that the testimony you shall give in this deposition will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Simpson. Good My name morning. is Daniel Petrocelli. I represent Plaintiff Frederick Goldman in this lawsuit against you. We wanted some justice, and we wanted that to come from a court. And it didn't come from the criminal trial. Ron got zero justice. I will forever be proud of my son and my family. Thank you. And when we discovered that there was another avenue, a civil trial, we thought of that as the only way we we're going to ever have a chance at justice. Can you tell me what you told Van Adder and Lang where you were between 10 and 11? Whatever they asked me, I told them. Whatever they asked me, I told them. I recall that, yes. Well, what I want to know is what answers you gave. To what? Ask me the question like they asked me, and I'll give you an Where answer. Where were you between 10 and 11? I don't know if they asked me that question. I was if home. They, if they did ask you, what did you say? I don't recall if they asked me, so I don't know what I said. Yeah. Why don't you ask me? I just did. Where were Why you? Why don't you ask me? All right, Mrs. Robertson, do you have the envelope with the seal very close, please? Yes, Your Honor. All right, would you give those to Deputy Trower? I was convinced beyond any doubt that he was going to be found guilty. All right, Madam Foreperson, you've had the opportunity to review the verdict forms. Every piece of evidence pointed to one person and one person only. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder. When it ended the way that it did, it felt like a slap in the face because the halls of justice, that's where you get justice. That's where everything balances out. In violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Ronald Lyle Goldman, a human being, as charged in count two of the information. For us, it was the smack across the face and head of finding out that Ron just got nothing, just received no justice at all. Two lives were gone, one nearly decapitated. My son stabbed 33 times. That meant nothing. 
It was theatrics at its finest, and a murderer walked free. When they panned to the family, Kim was sobbing. It was like being stabbed in the heart with a knife to see it and know. For us, it was a bad verdict. For them, the person who killed their loved one was going to walk out and throw a party. Last um, June 13th, 94, was the um, worst nightmare of my life. This is the second. <laughs> For the Goldmans, it seems any hope for justice is gone. They had taken on a media Goliath and lost. When we discovered that there was another avenue, a civil trial, I don't think we had any comprehension of what was going to be involved, what it was going to take, how it was going to happen. It was just something that we learned about and said, this is a second chance at justice. No one had really heard of civil cases back then. It didn't feel right because we were suing and the only punishment was money. And so it was very confusing, just kind of the internal debate of whether or not we wanted to do that. In a legal system, there's two ways to proceed in a case. If you're charged criminally, you're in the criminal justice system, and 12 jurors have to unanimously agree, 12 to 0, beyond a reasonable doubt, that I committed the crime. Starkly different in a civil case. You get 12 jurors in the box, but you only need nine to rule in your favor, and it's a lesser standard, what's called a preponderance of the evidence, just a little past 50%. If the jury finds that, they can find liability. Many in Los Angeles are outraged over a system they believe can't deliver justice. Paul Marciano, the founder of the Los Angeles-based clothing manufacturer Guess Incorporated, is among them. I followed the case, I followed the fact, I followed evidence, blah, 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 and the verdict come and it's like, that case was about the incompetence, the incompetence of the D district attorney office. To pursue a civil case, the Goldmans will need an attorney. Marciano believes his lawyer is perfect for the job. His name, Daniel Petricelli. And I said, Dan, this thing will happen in our city is crazy. This is wrong. And he said, Dan, you must take this case. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, you must take this case. The country needs someone like you. They need to have this verdict turned around. And I said, I would like you to do that case. And he said, I've never done one criminal case in my life. I don't do those kinds of cases. I've never handled a criminal case. In fact, I never litigated a personal injury case. I was a business litigation lawyer. I said, you have to do it, not for you, for everybody in the city. A lot of people cannot understand or comprehend what's happened. At least that someone will bring a sense of justice here. I was quite sure that what I was going to do was explain to Fred why I really couldn't take his case. But when I opened the door, there was like a transformation that took place. He was almost like a television character to me up to that point in time, someone I had seen on television. Ron and Nicole were butchered by their client. Do any of you believe otherwise? But when I saw him in person for the first time, um, the reality set in, and I could see the loss and the pain etched all over his face. And when he ushered me into the living room, furniture was in different places, pushed to the side, and it was dark. And there was this very deep, thick sadness that immediately enveloped you. It had the smell of death. We sat with him, and we had our list of questions, and we interviewed him. And it's something just 
clicked. It was just, uh, sounds kind of hokey, but it was kind of kismet. Dan made a comment to us that if we chose him to be the attorney, he would want us to be involved. And we kind of all chuckled, and, you know, because there was not a chance in living hell that um, we weren't going to be involved. And we talked, and we talked, and we talked. As we spoke through the wee hours of the morning, the reality of his loss became real to me. It was raw. It couldn't help but affect you. And, you know, as a lawyer, I'd been representing companies and wealthy individuals. And here was a chance to represent a father fighting for his son. Before I knew it, it was two or three o'clock in the morning. And by then I knew I was gonna do this. Petricelli warns the Goldmans the case will not be easy. But in a civil case, they will have some advantages. In the criminal case, Simpson had the Fifth Amendment right not to testify. In the civil case, I explained to Fred, he would have no such choice. If he refuses to testify, he will lose the case by default. In fact, he would be required to testify long before the trial in a pretrial deposition. You ever strike her? No. You ever hurt her? Yes. You ever physically hurt her? Yes. You ever bruise her? Yes. Did you cause bruises on her body through acts of violence by you towards her? I believe the bruises that were on her body, I was responsible for if she got them from me being physical with her, or if she got them when she fell when she was outside, I was responsible for it. If she fell when she was outside, it's because you made her fall, right? No. Because you were hitting her, right? No. You were pounding her. No, that's incorrect. You made her face black and blue, didn't you? If her face was black and blue the next day or two days later, I was responsible for it. No matter how it happened that day, I was the person responsible. KFWB News Time 428. While the father of the late Ron Goldman, Fred Goldman, announces a new attorney to take on O.J. Simpson in civil court. The Goldman family hires a business... The attorney, Dan Petricelli, says he hopes to depose O.J. Simpson for the civil action suit. In October 1995, news that the family of murder victim Ron Goldman hired little-known civil litigator Dan Petricelli to represent them in a wrongful death lawsuit against O.J. Simpson spread like wildfire. The next day, I checked my voicemails. And on a typical day, I might have, you know, two or three voicemails. And I had 25 or 30 voicemails, and they were all from members of the media, all asking, you know, for interviews. I was terrified listening to this. Like, what have I gotten myself into? I'd never spoken to a reporter before. I remember walking to this bank of microphones and seeing this sea of reporters. And I had this complete out-of-body experience, like, what am I doing here? This is like a scene out of a movie. I had a full-scale anxiety attack. I felt myself choking. I couldn't swallow. I just wanted to get through this alive. We think that when uh, all is said and done, we will find a jury to conclude that uh, Mr. Simpson was the man responsible for the death of Ron Goldman. We already knew the power of O.J. Simpson's money and his team. We knew that he could get any expert, any attorney. He could have 10 attorneys if he wanted to. Investigators, he had unlimited resources, fame, fortune, people who adored him despite a mountain of evidence showing that he was a double murderer. And here was the Goldman family, sad, broken, they weren't rich people. Fred had a real job. They didn't have tons of money. They couldn't just reach out and say, we want the biggest team of civil litigators. They weren't in that position. They were just heartbroken people who had been terribly wronged by the criminal justice system and they had one last chance to try to get some kind of justice. To my surprise, my colleagues and my partners at the law firm were immediately supportive that we would take this case on. Uh, we would not charge Mr. Goldman. And uh, we would do it as a public service. Pursuing the case could potentially cost millions of dollars. 
Mr. Goldman, for his part, helped raise money to defray certain costs of doing the case. We had to hire experts. We had to create a war room for the course of the trial. Uh, we had all sorts of travel expenses. People started sending money to help with our case. It was expensive and people wanted to help and people wanted to be part of our journey and our, and our, and our mission and our path to justice. When we started getting responses, it was really mind boggling to open up these letters. There was one that was a, a little card from a child that in very noticeably child handwriting said something about, we love Ron, et cetera. The letter was in crayon from a child saying, I just wanna, I just wanna help, and it was a dollar bill. You know in your heart that mom and dad had something to do with that, but it was gut-wrenching. The support we received from our clients and from the community in general was quite extraordinary. Day one, Petrocelli's David against Simpson's Goliath. Time was of the essence. A trial date is set for October. We had to do a virtual autopsy of what transpired in the criminal case. We got access to all the evidence. I personally immersed myself in everything that transpired in that case, including reading every book that had been written about that case. Once the plaintiff's team assembled itself, everybody went to work 24-7. Much of the work had to be done prior to depositions, which in turn had to be accomplished before the trial. One of the things that's a little bit different about a civil case than a criminal case is you're allowed to take discovery. And that means in this case, we could take the deposition of Simpson before the civil trial started and see what his answers were going to be to the questions we were going to ask him on the witness stand at the trial. And then you can try to find out what his story is going to be, what his excuses are going to be. We call that process of confronting a witness with a contrary prior answer impeachment. I knew going into this deposition that the whole objective was to gather as much impeachment evidence and impeachment ammunition as I possibly could for use later on when Simpson was examined at trial. Petrocelli's plan to trap Simpson is simple. Prove that he was capable of physically abusing his ex-wife. Prove that the physical evidence in the case pointed only toward him and proved that on June 12, 1994, Simpson had motive to kill his ex-wife, Nicole, and a young waiter named Ron Goldman, who, in a tragic twist of fate, was returning a pair of glasses that had been left at the restaurant at which he worked by Nicole's mother. He was simply at the wrong place at the wrong time. I knew that he wasn't going to confess to the murders. So I knew that everything, or just about everything he would say, would be a lie. Once Dan Petricelli got the case, he embraced it 1,000%. Some people would look at the Simpson case and say, too many details, don't get lost in the weeds. But in this case, the devil is in the details. Much of the work I did on this case was to try to understand deeply the motive for these killings, what happened in that relationship, what went wrong in that relationship, what went wrong on those particular days leading up to the murder, what happened on that day, and not only understanding, but being able to then prove that he was capable of doing such a thing, to separate the persona from the person. In this conversation, do you recall saying he would kill Nicole? Absolutely not. Do you recall having any conversation about killing Nicole, even if he didn't mean it seriously? None, absolutely none, ever. The court was very concerned about protecting the fairness of the trial process. The date, the time and place of Simpson's deposition were kept a secret. When I arrived to my office where the deposition was going to take place, it was ringed with television trucks, cameras, crews. 
there was all kinds of media. We couldn't figure out how it ever got out. But frankly, the assumption was that their side must have let it out, because we certainly didn't have any reason to want to let it out. And it was, here we go with the circus again. We've waited a long time to have an opportunity to ask the hard questions and uh, have questions answered under oath. And I think out of it will come a lot of very interesting things. When I first met Simpson and was escorting him into my offices for his deposition, he was very friendly, wanted to chit chat, and part of me wanted to jump right in and talk with him and ask him, how did he dodge that tackle against UCLA? And then I had to have a reality check. So wait a second, I'm here representing my client and he killed my client. So we are in the internal conference room on the 10th floor of our building, and this is where the majority, if not all, of the depositions in the Simpson civil case took place. Mr. Simpson sat in this chair when he was grilled for 11 days. The court reporter would tend to sit here and transcribe the deposition. And then you'd have Fred Goldman typically would be somewhere around the middle of the table towards the back, never wanting to really get too close to the killer. We had discussions with Fred and his family about preparing themselves to be in the same room with O.J. Simpson, to you know, sit across a conference room table no more than three or four feet from Simpson. It was difficult for him, and he told me not to worry. He goes, you know, I'm not gonna blow up, I'm not gonna do anything rash. But a lot of people in the media were always questioning, you know, whether Fred would come in with a gun, for example, because of how raw Fred's feelings were. As much as I would like to have grabbed him by the throat and strangled him, knowing that it was on camera and knowing that ultimately he was probably going to be exactly the same in the courtroom, that was fine. Let the son of a bitch hang himself. He, by choice, murdered two people, by choice. And uh, he should never be left alone for that reason. Again, he belongs in jail and death row. Besides the Goldman family attorneys, also in the room are attorneys for Sharon Rufo, Ron Goldman's birth mother, who had been estranged from Ron for 15 years, and the attorney representing the family of Nicole Brown, John Kelly. Mr. Simpson can go out there and speak for himself. My client, Nicole, uh, Mr. Simpson knows this better than anybody, cannot speak for itself right now. Simpson is represented by the well-known trial attorney, Bob Baker who has 25 years of civil litigation experience, and Bob Blazier, who was also a member of Simpson's legal dream team during the criminal trial. Simpson would come through the door to the north. Fred would enter on the south side of the room. We tried to keep them apart. You know, Simpson was a pretty arrogant guy, and you knew when he was in the building. There were times when I could hear him coming from floors away, laughing and joking. He was very obnoxious. He felt invincible after scathing by in the criminal trial. He was just very pompous and very arrogant and walked in and tried to own the place. We all wanted to protect Fred from that. And then the deposition started, and we had another opportunity to see the killer and his arrogance at work. He was in a chair that allowed him to lean way back, and he would lean way back with his arms behind his head like this. And as Dan was asking him questions, he would go, yeah, yeah, or he'd mumble. And sometimes he'd put his head down on the table. He just didn't give a crap. It was simple as that. It was just a big bother to him. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the deposition was wide ranging. Not just, you know, where were you on the night of June 12th, but going through his entire history, and particularly the history of his relationship with Nicole Brown Simpson. And you cut her lip, didn't you? That's incorrect. You hit her with your fist and you caused her lip to split open, is that right? That's incorrect. Because these murders happened for a reason. This wasn't a random drive-by shooting. This wasn't a robbery. This wasn't a rape murder. This was a rage killing motivated by the intense personal feelings between Simpson 
and his recently estranged ex-wife. We were convinced that we had to establish motive. You know, we, we had to show that there was a reason why he would commit this murder. Because he was, you know, a rich and famous guy. He was already separated from Nicole, so what would drive him to do this? We did have to dig deeply into the relationship between the two and to the obvious anger that he had towards Nicole. We all knew on our side of the case that he would lie about every important fact. That was no mystery. He wasn't going to admit to killing Nicole and Ron. He was taking that to his grave. And so his whole story was going to be one big lie. We knew that, he knew that. I believe his lawyers knew that. I believe everybody knew that. So this was going to be an exercise in getting as many lies as possible on the record, and then later on showing to the jury that in fact, they were all lies. How do you count for the finger marks on Nicole's throat, Mr. Simpson? I don't know. I don't know, I never saw them, so I can't account for them. And you caused scars on her face, didn't you? Uh, that's incorrect. We spent a fair amount of time trying to prepare him, um, but he, he still has a bad habit of volunteering stuff and trying to explain things. I'm wrestling her and I'm holding her. It's pretty tough not to have your person around their shoulders and their necks and their bodies. We were wrestling and um, it, it could have happened, yes. What could have happened is that you could have had your fingers around her throat and caused those marks. Is that what you're saying? His narrative was to say that they wrestled and pushed each other around. He would not admit that he struck her in any way, shape, or form. With Simpson, I remember, it was quite easy to get him to talk. And he was a good talker, too. I mean, he could talk to a post. You ask him a question, he would go on and on. Now, he would spin his side of the story. But the more he spoke, the easier it was for us to later on attack it and show that he was lying just about every single important fact in the case. And you remember choking her? No, remember? I know I didn't choke her. You remember having your fingers cause marks to be left on her neck? Not specifically. I think any marks that's on her, I take full responsibility for. I don't know what else you want me to do. I take total responsibility Why? for it. Because I shouldn't have handled the situation the way I did. I, all my life with Nicole, no matter what was going on, I handled it without being physical with her. And that time I got physical with her, and I'm ashamed of it. I wish it not had happened, and I, I, I make no excuses for it. It came across as being a little bit disingenuous for O.J. to say he was responsible, but then not, not acknowledging what they claim he did. Maybe I was responsible, but I, I never hit her. And then he would always somehow or other try to blame her. It was her fault. She would argue with me, or she would start all these arguments. And it was her fault. And I would never hit her. I don't know how she would get black and blue. And You know, he, he never owned anything. I'm not asking you about the moral or other responsibility. I'm asking for what happened, OK? Yes. You had your fingers around her throat, correct? Uh, I could have touched her neck, yes. You mean you could have touched her? This was I a could've... violent episode, wasn't it? It was. Yes, it was. You were enraged when you had this act of violence towards her, weren't you? Mm, I don't know if that's totally true, but I was angry, yes. Very angry, right? Yes. In rage is a fair description of your your state of mind, correct? No, it's not. Not anger? Anger, Intense yes. anger? Anger. You, you, Angry enough a, to hit enough. her. That's enough. But I'm not no. going to let you just continue to batter him the rest batter of the Batter him? Month. That's right. That's Here an you. appropriate word, Mr. Baker. For 11 days in early 1996, Attorney Daniel Petricelli interrogates O.J. Simpson about his possible role in the murders of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown, and a young waiter named Ron Goldman. Did you ever meet Ron Goldman? Not that I know of. Did you ever talk to Ron Goldman? Not that I know of. Did you ever see Ron Goldman? Not that I know of. During the entire time of the criminal case, Simpson, of course, was incarcerated and he spent his time reading every single thing he could get his hands on about the case. We knew that he had committed to memory what every witness had said. 
I remember deliberately deciding that I would almost question him randomly in, in a sort of haphazard manner so that he could not keep linear track of everything in his mind as he had memorized. And did Nicole say to you in uh, May or June of 1994, if you really want this marriage to work out, you're gonna have to go to therapy to control your anger? No. So just to give you a, a very simple example, uh, rather than have him explain to me, you know, what he did chronologically from the moment he boarded that plane to go to Chicago uh, late in the evening of June 12th, I, for example, asked him, Mr. Simpson, what were you wearing when you were flying back to Chicago? What clothing did you put on when you left Chicago to go back to LA? Uh, we've been through all of this. I started off with some jeans and I ended up in twilight with some black pants and a white shirt and whatever. So then I might have gone on to a entirely different subject. Now, when you were a youth, were you involved in any uh, gang fights? Yes. Were you a participant? Yes. Did you use a knife in any of those? No. Uh, what weapons did you use? This. So I would uh, jumble up the story so that he couldn't just give it back to me in the way that he had memorized it. I think it was very effective because you could see his mind racing. Tell me about pulling the Bronco when you walked out the door and went out the uh, Ashford. Yeah, I went out on Ashford. And what did you do? I pulled the Bronco in, took the golf clubs off. Do you have any reason to believe it's not yours? Well, I know that. I don't know. Do you just... believe you were on the Bundy property on that occasion? I, I need it. I recognize it as a white. You need a sir. Call, sir. Are those your socks? I have no way of knowing. We certainly weren't going to just accept his answers. He was going to get drilled. And the more we drilled, the more uncomfortable he became. And that's a wonderful sight to see. When you were half dressed, you came down and dropped the suit mm -hmm. a bag mm -hmm. on this golf bag, correct? I don't know if it was on it, but in the same place, yeah. Petricelli's peppering of questions included the status of his relationship with then-girlfriend Paula Barbieri. You had a monogamous relationship with her at that time, is that right? With who? Paula. Monogamous? Yeah. I'm a little confused by the question, but if... She's the only girl I had sex with from for the probably the previous four weeks. Did you say something in the message to the effect that, uh, hi, this is OJ, I'm unattached for the first time in my life? Possibly. Was that true? Mm, possibly. Dan's an effective cross-examiner, and, and like all effective cross-examiners, he'll use different paces at different times. At times, he'll go fairly slowly, allow the person to fully answer, think about the next question and go on to that. At other times, you want to push the person a little harder. You want to ask staccato questions. You want to make sure that, that you're throwing them off guard and getting the truth out of the person. He knows exactly where he's trying to take the witness, what answers he's looking for, what facts he's trying to establish and lock in. She said that you uh, were screaming and yelling and using profanity at the table. Is that true? I don't believe so, no. And she said you uh, followed her down to the uh, ladies' room? No, that's wrong. She said you barged into the ladies' room, kicking the door open, going inside? That's wrong. Said you made a big scene in front of the patrons and the restaurant manager? That's, uh, she, she said that, yes. Yeah, is that true? No. Can you think of any other um, brand names of shoes that you have worn? No. You're not going to try to trip him up by asking him the same question 15 times. That's not appropriate uh, conduct at this deposition. I'm trying to get the truth. I'm not trying to trip him up. If he's telling the truth, he won't be tripped up. Petrocelli obviously wanted to get into some of the things that would help his case more. Bob Baker didn't want O.J. talking a lot. He would keep telling O.J., don't answer that, don't answer that, don't answer that. How many times during the entire time you lived with her at Rockingham were you unfaithful? You don't have to answer that. How many, don't answer that. How many extramarital relationships did you have? Don't answer that either. Well, you said uh, they had a great relationship. I'm entitled to examine him about that. I don't agree with you, and he's not going to answer that question. You don't want to answer that question? Don't answer that question either. The evidence amassed by the LAPD was sufficient to have convicted Simpson many times over. They had his 
blood evidence, they had DNA evidence, they had hair fiber evidence, they had clothing fiber evidence. The one piece of evidence that they did not have was the shoes that the killer wore. The scientific investigation division of the LAPD discovered that this footprint left at the crime scene was left by a Bruno Mali shoe. It's a distinctive kind of footprint, and it's an expensive, not common pair of shoes. The impressions were measured. They were size 12. 9% of the population wears size 12. Simpson wears size 12. The police tried to find if Simpson had a pair of those shoes, and they were never able to locate them. And Simpson denied that he ever had. When I questioned him in his pretrial deposition, about whether he owned Bruno Magli shoes. Did you ever buy uh, shoes that you knew were Bruno Magli shoes? No. And I said, why would you uh, never own those shoes? You own lots of shoes. Because I know if Bruno Magli makes shoes that look like the shoes they had in court that's involved in this case, I would have never worn those ugly ass shoes. You thought they, those were ugly ass shoes? Yes. And I said, well, why are they ugly ass? Why were they ugly ass shoes? Because in my mind, they were. What about them was ugly, Mr. Simpson? The look of them, the style of them. What, what about the style? I don't know, they were ugly to me. Aesthetically, I felt that they were ugly, and I guess beauty is an eye of the beholder, and to me, they were ugly shoes. Little did Simpson know, his words would come back to haunt him. Nicole Brown Simpson's friend, Faye Resnick, Faye Resnick's she testimony to... has raised a lot of questions about Simpson. Lawyers in the O.J. Simpson civil case traveled to New York City to take the deposition of one of Nicole Brown's close friends, Faye Resnick. You were a friend of Nicole Brown Simpson, is that right? Yes. You may have to speak up a little bit so that the people at the end of the table can hear. Yes, I was. Faye Resnick is a woman who had been very close to Nicole and had written a book about her. So she was deposed in order to kind of find out what she knew about what had happened to Nicole. She knew a lot about the relationship between Simpson and Nicole, and she, she was one of our witnesses to the, the relationship and how Nicole feared him. Ms. Resnick testified under oath that you called her on May 2 or May 3, a telephone call with her. Uh, do you recall that? No, not okay. particularly, no. This telephone conversation that you just described, Ms. Resnick, was this the first time that you had ever disclosed to O.J. Simpson your knowledge of his prior abuse? Yes, it was. Did he say anything to you about the abuse when you brought it up in the conversation? Yes, he did. Apart from expressing to Faye your concerns over Nicole, did you... Did you ever express or vent any anger about Nicole? No, not any anger, not to, to the degree that you okay. mentioned earlier, no. What did he say? He said that he doesn't beat her anymore. He used the words, anymore? Mm hmm Yes, he did. And I reminded him that he had just told me that he would kill Nicole. And he reiterated that he had no option, essentially, that she was bringing it on herself. In this conversation, you told Faye that he would kill Nicole. Do you recall saying that? Absolutely not. Recall having any conversation with Faye Resnick uh, uh, about killing Nicole, even if he didn't mean it seriously? None, absolutely none, ever. He was aggressive. He was out of control. He was spewing with anger. It was, it was frightening for me to be on the other end of the phone, having even the distance of our homes. I was afraid. I don't know about angry. I was uh, concerned about what the heck was going on with Nicole. I know I expressed to Faye, and I expressed to the Browns. Our objective was to show that he would lie and lie and lie over and over and over again. Um, and convinced the jury that if he were a liar, he were a murderer. The pregnancy beatings where he used to kick her in the stomach and tell her that she was worthless. Do you know whether she ever suffered any injuries while she was pregnant? No. And she said that, um... Yeah. 
She said that Sydney saw some of them, and she, um, Can I stop for a minute, please? Faye Resnick was able to kind of describe how fearful Nicole was and some of the stories of him being abusive towards her. She painted a, a very clear picture of how he and Nicole's relationship was. Another friend of Nicole's, an LAPD officer who was retired at the time of the civil trial, specialized in domestic violence cases. Did members of the LAPD frequent your house from time to time? One individual uh, had used my pool, I think, when he was still with the LAPD. Who was that? Uh, Ron Ship. I've known OJ since, at this time, since I was 16 years old. Never seen him mad. He's been over his house many times. I never heard him, you know, moaning and groaning, oh, that son of a, you know, I mean, he would complain about some people, you know. And, you know, you know, but not really bad. One day, Nicole asked me to sit down with her and talk. And as we got into conversation and she started talking about him, she started crying. Now, Nicole, everybody that knows her, she's a pretty tough woman. I had never, ever seen her like that, ever. And I looked at her face, and I could tell she had heavy makeup on. There was marks, bruises on her face. She got real serious, and she just said, you know, Ron, he did it to me and brought down a bunch of pictures of the past when he had beaten her. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Every ounce of respect that I ever had for him kind of went out of the window. And if Nicole said you did those things to her, she would not be telling the truth. Is correct. that what you're saying? That's correct. She would be lying. Yes. But she would not tell that lie under oath. She would tell that lie when she's not under oath? Is that what you're saying? Possibly, yes. She would lie to herself, even? I leaned over, and, and, and I hugged her. And she, she put her head on my, on, on my, you know, my, right, my right shoulder or my chest around that area. And then she just laid into me. She just told me everything that happened between them and how I didn't really know him. She started asking me about the domestic violence, the class that I taught. She looked at the lesson plan, and she said, do you think there's any way that you could have this conversation with him and let him read this? Going back, what happened with Schiff a couple of days later? Well, he came by. And what did he discuss with you? Well, he wanted to discuss what, I don't know if he wanted to discuss what was happening. He tried to talk to Nicole. He came in and talked to me. Um, and um, he said that he had some expertise in this field. Field and of he made domestic some, violence? Yes, and he made some suggestions. I told him when he was trying to figure out what he should do, and I said, man, what I think you should do, I think you should uh, say, you know, you had a problem, you're going to get help, and admit, you know, that, that you did what you did, you know, because there's no getting around it. I said, the woman's battering groups, they'll probably embrace you. What did he suggest to you? He wanted me to make some public statement about, uh, about the incident. You said no? Yes. Why? Because I didn't want to. Sure that the testimony you shall give in this deposition will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I hope you got it. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Perhaps one of the most dramatic moments in the deposition process comes when Simpson's best friend, Al Cowlings, testifies. Cowlings drove his white Bronco with a suicidal Simpson in the back seat when Simpson was on the run from police five days after the murders. When we went down to the hospital, I stood by her. And when, when the nurse asked her what had happened, Nicole looked at me and I said, Nicole, you got to tell him. And she told him that she was hit. By? By OJ. I don't, know, I don't know if she said OJ, but she said she was hit. They asked her, how did you sustain your injuries or whatever like that? And she said, I was hit. Okay. It was clear that he was deeply conflicted about the case because he was very close to Nicole Brown Simpson. He was almost like a brother to her. Was there any doubt in your mind as to whether or not Nicole loved you as a friend? We had a good friendship. Okay. You think she loved you? She never told me she loved me, but I know we had a good friendship. Okay. Did you love her? Yes. Al Cowlings was a, a very good friend of Nicole's as well as OJ's. So he was obviously very upset about what had happened uh, with a homicide. Cowlings was even a groomsman at OJ and Nicole's wedding. This is true. 
OJ and Nicole, with all my love, I wish you nothing but the best. It became a big issue for him in terms of how he dealt with the fact that Nicole was murdered and OJ's his best friend. Mr. Collins, I'm going to ask you to look at this picture. It's been previously marked as exhibit number 45. My take on Collins was that Simpson had ducked a life sentence in the criminal case. The civil case was just about money. He loved Nicole also, and he wasn't going to lie about anything. And, you know, if Simpson got whacked with a judgment or something, he just didn't care. I ask if you recognize that picture. We confronted A.C. Cowlings with photographs of Nicole, the battered photographs with the black eyes and things of that nature. And A.C. Cowlings started to cry. And it was heartfelt. I remember clearly him breaking down and crying. And I think he said, I love Nicole. And it was genuine. And who do you recognize that to be? Late January and early February 1996. The weeks-long deposition of O.J. Simpson continues in the civil case brought against him for the wrongful deaths of Nicole Brown and Ronald Goldman. In his criminal trial, in which he was acquitted, Simpson's attorneys had accused members of the LAPD of being racist and having planted evidence at the crime scene and at Simpson's home in order to implicate Simpson in the slayings. His attorneys in the civil trial attempt the same strategy. As of June 17, Mr. Simpson, did you have any information that caused you to believe that you were being framed or set up by the LAPD? No. The whole defense was, was they were trying to say either that all of this incriminating evidence against Simpson was planted, or that somehow all of the incriminating evidence against Simpson was contaminated by incompetent police officers. That some of the officers were incompetent and couldn't do the job, and other ones were tricky and sneaky and could go behind the scenes and plant evidence without being caught. And they expected you to buy both of those arguments because either one alone could not possibly prove that he was not guilty. Simpson was examined by the police and then members of his defense team immediately after the murders. He told detectives he could have cut his hand while packing for a trip to Chicago the night of the slayings and that the wound had nothing to do with the stabbing deaths of Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman. I know I'm the number one target and now you're telling me I got blood all over the place. Well, there's blood at your house in the driveway, yeah. and we've got a search warrant, and we're going to go and get the blood. Yeah. Is that your blood that's dripped there? It, if it's dripped, it's what I dripped running around trying to leave. Last night? Yeah, and I wasn't aware that it was, I was aware that I, you know, I was trying to get out of the house. I didn't, didn't pay any attention to it. I, I, I saw it when I was in the kitchen, and I grabbed a napkin or something, and that was it. And I didn't think about it after that. That was last night after you got home from the recital where you were right That was around. last night when I was, I don't know what I was, I was in a, I was in the car, getting my jump out of the car. I was in the house, I was throwing hangers and stuff in, in my suitcase. I was doing my little crazy, what I do. Everybody who's ever picked me up say that OJ's a whirlwind at the end as he's running, he's grabbing things. Though he originally told the police he cut himself at home and reopened the cut in Chicago, he now changes his story. Did you tell the police, hey, I cut myself last night, maybe that's from me? No. Did you offer any explanation at that time with respect to those blood drops? No. Did you conclude in your own mind that perhaps those blood drops were left by you because you had cut your finger no. the night before? No. You had not, no thoughts one way or another how those blood drops got there? I didn't think about blood drops. I was thinking about Nicole, my kids, and why was I handcuffed? Over the course of several days of depositions, Simpson says that he cut his finger in his Chicago hotel room after learning of Nicole's death. 
I broke the glass uh, in the process of going back and forth to the phone and trying to get packed. I cut myself trying to move the glass out of my way. Somewhere in that, that happened. Did you remember cutting your finger? I remember bleeding. Do you remember and, cutting uh, your middle finger no, off? No, I remember bleeding and then seeing that I was bleeding, so. When Dan asked him, well, you say you might have cut your finger in Chicago. How? How did you do it? How did you break the glass? Was it with your left hand, your right hand? And exactly how did you cut it with the glass? I was um, trying to scoop the glass into the sink with uh, some toilet paper and, a, I believe, a towel. At the crime scene, there was not only the blood of Ron and Nicole, which, of course, you would expect because they were murdered there, but Simpson's blood was there, too. And Simpson's blood was on the glove that was found at his house, and it was in his car mixed with the blood of Ron and Nicole. And he came back from Chicago with a big cut on his hand. So obviously, those all tied in together. You weren't aware of any cuts on your left hand prior to coming to Chicago, mm, correct? No, I, I was, no, I, I never, no, I never saw a cut on my hand. No, I haven't, no. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Armed with a tape from the police, Petricelli knows Simpson is lying and he continues to hammer away at the former football star as part of his strategy to lay a trap for Simpson when they go to trial. You can't just go in a deposition and say, tell me what happened that day. You have to know what happened and target your questions to make sure you get that person on the record on the very exact piece of information that you want. It's like surgery with words. And Dan was a master of that. Obviously, Petrocello did not think that it really happened that way, and that's why he was peppering him with questions after question after question, because he wanted to try and show lack of credibility on OJ's part in terms of his explanation of what happened in Chicago. Dan just kept asking the question, and if he didn't get an answer, he'd ask him again. Of course, the killer was always getting frustrated that he didn't like things not going his way. Um, but ultimately, he was pushed to answer. Did you cut it on one of the broken pieces of glass? He went for detail, and Simpson got more and more distraught. The more the cuts were talked about. Yeah. On what piece? <laughs> Can we take a break? Yeah, sure. Jesus Christ. <laughs> A young lawyer came into my office. She was on our legal team, and she plopped down the paper of record in the Simpson case, which was the <laughs> National Enquirer. Every day I wrote a story about the Simpson case. Right there was a picture of Simpson walking in the end zone at Rich Stadium in Buffalo as an NBC TV announcer with a pair of shoes that looked like the Bruno Mogli shoes, but then there was a blow up of one of them and it clearly was a Bruno Mogli shoe. I would have never worn those ugly ass shoes. It was a big deal, but it was the National Enquirer, right? So who's gonna believe them? They don't have a lot of credibility. We hired a photographic expert. He was former FBI, you know, one of the top photographic experts in the world. And he analyzed the photo. This photo was not doctor. This photo was real. We ran the photographer down. He was living in Buffalo. His name was Harry Skull Jr. Merry Christmas. The, the guy had, like, the camera equipment to use to take the photographs. He had the negatives. He had his ticket to the game. He had everything. He was a string photographer. And that is a picture of you looking at Exhibit 1, correct? It appears to be me, yes. Okay. And the jacket you're wearing, could you describe it? No. Do you remember owning that jacket? No. Remember wearing that jacket? That, that's your face, right? You ask my face, and that, that's your shirt, right? And what about the shirt? Looks like a white shirt. Okay. No, no, nothing stands out about that white shirt? Uh, no, I like the collar, though. Okay. What do you like about it? I don't know. It looks nice. I remember looking at like the collar of the shirt he had. Like, that's a nice shirt or a nice collar or something. You know, we're talking about a murder case, and he's talking about, oh, I like the way that, that, that looks there. That's sort of nice. And those are your shoes, aren't they? Looking at the close-up of the shoes, do you believe that those were shoes that you owned at that time? No. 
I said, well, that's you, isn't it? He goes, yeah, that's me, but they are not my shoes. There was no way those pictures were doctored. It was proof that he had the shoes on his feet, that he owned them. But we also had blood evidence that only pointed to one person, and we still couldn't get a jury to find him guilty. So now I'm thinking, oh, now you put him in shoes. I don't know that that was going to be what was going to make this jury think that he was the killer. I wasn't totally prepared to put all my faith in it yet. Photographs of shoes similar to those worn by the murderer. Dozens of pieces of evidence from the crime scene. Proof of continual domestic abuse from police reports and friends. The plaintiff's attorneys had their legal guns loaded going into trial. But would it be enough to beat O.J. Simpson? Everyone wondered, would these civil lawyers be able to do something that had seemed impossible? Could they surmount the fact that O.J. Simpson was a famous person and many, many people just simply could not see him as a murderer? No one knew. No one knew if it would be enough. The civil trial took place in Santa Monica, three or four blocks from the Pacific Ocean, where the courthouse is located. The reporters and members of the media were fond of calling it OJ by the sea. I remember saying to the firm that I didn't think there would be much publicity about the case, that the press and the public were certain to lose interest. Boy, was I wrong. How come you can't deal with the facts? I could not walk into the courthouse without being followed by throngs of reporters all the time. O.J. Simpson was very arrogant. He was jovial, and in the morning when he'd drive in with his bodyguards, he'd try to engage the media. Best of luck, the best of luck, man. Best of luck. Man, you. He was back to being, you know, OJ of the Hertz commercials. That doesn't look like me. <laughs> How'd it go? He's the greatest. Oh, I think he was very confident. I beat the first trial, I'm gonna beat this one too. Because there are no cameras in the courtroom, there is no video or audio record of the trial. However, many of the questions and answers from the depositions in the case are similar to what went on inside the courtroom. Would you raise your right hand, please? Do you do solemnly swear that the testimony you shall give in this the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Simpson. The testimony of Simpson was much like the deposition in the sense that we all knew he was not going to confess to killing two people. And the exercise was really one designed simply to show that he would lie about his involvement in these murders. The idea being that if the jury concluded that he was a liar, then he was a murderer when I confronted him in court in front of a packed courtroom, no more than three or four feet from him. But I was a little nervous. And I remember starting my examination of him at trial by confronting him with his vicious spousal abuse of Nicole Brown Simpson, including beating her face almost to a pulp on New Year's Eve, 1989. We had photographs that she had saved from that beating that we displayed to the jury on a big screen television that sat on a stand right next to Simpson while he was on the witness stand. And when I confronted him about causing all the injuries, you know, her bruised and battered face, he tried to avoid answering by uh, saying, I take full responsibility for what happened to her. Yes, I saw her bruise and I felt responsible for those bruises. If it came from me or if it came when she fell outside, in any event, I was responsible for it. That was his mantra. He had said that repeatedly when, he, from the time he had gotten out of jail and a lot of his public statements, I take responsibility, I take responsibility. And I remember saying, I didn't ask you about whether you take responsibility. He said, it's the jury's job to decide if you take responsibility. One of the things Dan did and did very effectively was he did get Simpson on the ropes and he did get under Simpson's skin and did show Simpson's true colors. 
I found myself, believe it or not, in competition with him. A person who had no athletic ability up against one of the greatest athletes of all time. And here I am in combat with this guy. Simpson is a confrontational guy. He's also a very competitive person, as is Dan. And it was a battle. I mean, the two of them were battling. What'd you do to her? I wrestled her. What does that mean? That means I had my hands on her, and I was trying to force her out of my bedroom. We wrestled. Simpson is up there talking about wrestling. Well, we wrestled a little. We, we tussled. We pushed back and forth. Did you ever strike her? No. Did you ever slap her? No. If she fell when she was outside, it's because you made her fall, right? No. Because you were hitting her, right? No. You were pounding her. No, that's incorrect. And the pictures in living color of Nicole's bruised and battered face were flashing by. He couldn't even go so far as to say, I made the mistake of my life that day. I hit her. He couldn't do that. You know, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't part of his persona. It was always somebody else was to blame. Never him. Never, 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 never. You could see him starting to lose that mask, the happy O.J. Simpson mask. It started to fade. He at one point put up his hands and said, I tried to like push her away, and he put up both fists, like balled up like this. And I said, you just put your fists up. Is that what you did that night? O.J. Simpson's attorney, Robert Baker, was all smiles when he arrived at the courthouse. But inside, he started to build his case by tearing down Nicole Brown Simpson, basically putting her on trial. Baker told the jury it was Nicole who was the pursuer in the months before the murders, trying to shoot down the theory that Simpson was a jealous, obsessed ex-husband. In fact, Baker said it was Simpson who wanted to end the relationship because of Nicole's mood swings. Simpson's attorneys attempted to defend him, by attacking the lifestyle of his former wife. I had found out that things were going on, and that was essentially what I was yelling about. But that wasn't about drug use by Nicole? Yes. In what sense? In the sense that I was told that day about them all doing drugs at a place called a monkey bar. One of the strategies for the defense was to cast Nicole Brown Simpson in the most negative light they could. Uh, trophy wife, married a high-profile athlete because of all the attendant benefits related to that, a party girl. I mean, the list went on and on. There was a lot of information that she was into drugs and that she was into a, a lot of different guys. We had to try and show that it was not all a one-sided situation. The defense also questioned the credibility of Ron Goldman. In the criminal case, the defense tried to make my brother out to be um, like a drug dealer and, um, you know, this loser. And in the civil case, they tried to do the same thing. They talked about that he didn't finish college and he had credit card debt and... He was a kid, he was 25 years old, and he was just kind of finding his way in his life. And I think that Dan did a really good job of just bringing that to the courtroom so that people could get to know my brother and to just see him for this beautiful human that tried to save his friend. And I think that's the legacy that got left. They wanted to bring in racism, they wanted to bring in planning of evidence. It was the same crap over and over again. But this was a trial in which the judge just wasn't going to allow game playing. It was going to be a legal proceeding. It was going to be about the law. The defense perpetrated this idea that the police planted evidence, which was literally impossible in the circumstances of the case if you understood exactly you know, what happened and when things happened. And so I asked Simpson about that. I said, well, you know, we heard in the criminal case that you think the police planted evidence. I mean, what proof do you have of that? He couldn't explain anything. How did the victim's blood get in his Bronco? Do you know why the blood on the council of the Bronco is consistent with a mixture of Ron Goldman's and Nicole's blood? No. How did the victim's blood get in his bedroom? Do you know why the blood on the socks in your bedroom matched Nicole's blood? No. Do you know why the shoe prints found at Bundy matched Bruno Mali shoes? No. 
You'd have no knowledge about any of these things? Mm, other than what I heard in court, no. There were no answers to any of these questions. Do you know why the blood in the foyer of your house matched your blood? No. I remember distinctly thinking to myself, finally, you have a lawyer in the courtroom who knows what he's doing. It was a thing of beauty. Do you know why the glove found at Rockingham had fibers matching Ron Goldman's shirt? I mean, I have no, no, I don't have okay. no knowledge of any of this that you're saying. I'd actually feel bad for O.J. Simpson because I knew that the evidence was mounting and I knew what Petrocelli was doing. He was teeing things up, his mountain of evidence. One of the key pieces of information that the plaintiff's attorneys hammered home was that Simpson was further enraged on the day of the murders because he received a voicemail from his then-girlfriend, Paula Barbieri, that said she was breaking up with him. On the morning of June 12th, Paula Barbieri called O.J. Simpson, got his answering service, and left a breakup message. It was quite detailed. Basically, things weren't working out. It wasn't what she'd hoped for. It was a clear breakup message. Barbieri did not testify at the civil trial, but lawyers played the tapes of her deposition. You left the message for Mr. Simpson 7 o'clock in the morning on his Bentley voicemail saying basically the relationship was over, right? Yes. Did you get a message from Paula Barbieri? No. Did you receive any message from her before you left? No. Did you receive any messages back from him at any time on June 12th? Um, yes. What were the messages that you picked up? What did they say? Um, sort of what was wrong now. You didn't get any phone messages from her that day? I don't believe I ever retrieved any message from her that day. In other words, from the content of the messages he left, you understood that he had already received your message. Is that right? Yes. We know O.J. Simpson received that message because the phone records show that he did call in for his messages and he did receive that particular message. Message manager, do you see that? Yes. It shows a call of eight minutes, do you see that? Yes. You picked up your message at that time? No. You know what that entry is for? No. No idea? At the time, I don't have any idea, but I'm assuming, oh, you told me not this. Well, do you now know what it is? I can only assume now. Tell me. Is. I'm assuming it's a message from Paul. Following your breakup with Mr. Simpson, did there come a time when your relationship began again? Yes. And when was that? Um, while he was in jail. The reason it becomes significant is that Simpson steadfastly maintained in his depositions and in his trial testimony that he never heard Paula Barbieri's breakup message. So you ask yourself, of all the damning evidence in the case, he's worried about and lying about that message. So why is that important to Simpson? I believe that he did not want anyone to know his frame of mind on June 12th. Probably what put things over the top for O.J. Simpson was Nicole Brown finally deciding that she was going to finally extricate herself from this relationship with O.J. Simpson. And I think the evidence established that that did not sit well with O.J. He did not react well to that. His daughter, Sydney, had a dance recital that evening. Simpson attended the recital, but when it was over, he expected to maybe join her and her family and his daughter, Sydney, for the post-recital dinner. But Nicole Brown Simpson publicly shunned him. She told him to get lost, I don't want you there. Then, Paula, his new big hope, she dumps him on the morning of the murder. So he's lost both. He was excluded from this family outing. He's lost that family, and he also lost the girlfriend. That was hope for his future. And he is a man left sitting in his living room, fuming. One of the most powerful moments of the civil trial was when Fred Goldman was on the stand. I was questioning him about the loss of his son and the relationship that they had. 
a few days before, I had Fred come to my house, and I said, Fred, you know, we're gonna call you this week, and we need to prepare your testimony. As I started to get all these papers that I had ready to go through various questions with him, he goes, we're not gonna prepare. I said, what do you mean we're not gonna prepare? He goes, I don't need any preparation to talk about my son. Just ask your questions and I'll answer them. This was Fred's first opportunity to really tell Ron's story from Ron's position, and it was earth-shattering. It was extremely emotional. He was speaking with such raw, honest emotions about uh, the loss of his son and how that will affect Fred and his family, you know, for the rest of their lives. I couldn't have been more thrilled, my first child, to be a, a, a boy. He was an amazing kid, just a super nice, loving, happy kid. And then as he grew up, of course, three years later, my daughter was born. Ron was the consummate big brother. Wherever they want, he would hold her hand. Not because I asked him to, because that's what he did. If there was ever a time during the trial that I lost it emotionally, it was when I was talking to Fred. And I say talking to him rather than questioning him because that's what it was. It was, it was just a talk about Fred and about the loss of his son, Ron. A person I never knew, a person I never met, but a person I grew to know almost uh, like he were my own son. Fred was on the witness stand, and they ran a picture, and it was Ron and Kim. They couldn't have been more than five, seven. The two of them were in these snow jackets with the little hoods. They were tromping off together in the snow. I was overwhelmed with emotion seeing it. That was the only time I almost ever lost it. I cried during uh, Fred's direct examination. I think everybody cried with possibly one exception, and that was Simpson and maybe some of his defense attorneys. It was a very moving moment in the trial. The jury felt Fred's pain. Obviously, this is your older brother. Um, we don't get to spend very much time together, so I'm very glad that I was able to be here uh, and spend this time with you, because God knows where I'll be in a year. So um, best of luck to you. There so was a videotape shown of the family. Fred and Ron clowning around together. In November of 1993, my stepsister uh, had a bat mitzvah. That's the last images that we have of him. We were all together, and there was this uh, great scene with my dad. One of his favorite songs is Old Time Rock and Roll by Bob Seger. In the video, my dad and my brother were standing next to each other and they were kind of like doing the thing next to each other. My brother just had the most electric smile on his face. And it was just cool to see my dad and my brother be in that moment. It was almost unbearable to watch. And I remember at the very end, we froze it on a frame depicting both Ron and Fred just loving each other and loving life. It was devastating to look at that and say, they will never have that again. We finally saw the destruction of a family at the hands of a murderer. O.J. Simpson smiled as he came to court for the first time in the new year, facing new incriminating evidence. Fred Goldman's attorney came armed with 30 newly discovered photos of Simpson allegedly wearing expensive Italian shoes similar to the ones worn by the murderer. One picture even appeared in the Buffalo Bills newsletter in November of 1993. I hopped on a plane, went to the Bills practice facility. One of the PR people pulled out the, the November 1993 newsletter from the Buffalo Bills booster club and showed me a picture of Simpson in this newsletter in the Bruno Mali shoes. I said, who took these photos? And he, uh, he said, talk to this guy, E.J. Flammers. He had 30 
color photographs that he had taken of Simpson that day. Just perfect photographs. You could tell exactly what the heels were, the make, the color, the size. It was the aha moment, and like a fingerprints put Simpson at the scene that night. Do you know whether the pants that are shown in Exhibit 1 are pants that belong to you? They look a little big on me, so I would normally I'm pretty fastidious about my clothing. Looking at the close-up of the shoes in front of you, do you believe that those were shoes that you owned at that time? No. Those aren't my shoes, even though you have a photograph showing me in those shoes. So do you believe him? If he's, if he's lying about one thing, he's lying about the other. By that time, I think all the jurors were looking at their shoes. They, they didn't believe a word that, that he was saying, but I mean, he was caught red-handed. He's in the shoes, same exact shoe that he wore when he murdered Ron and Nicole. He was confronted with all the evidence that showed that he was lying, whether it be a cell phone record that showed that he made a call at a certain point. I'm assuming it's a message from Paul that was made to your message manager? Yes. Is that what you're saying? It's what it is. Whether it be the diary of his uh, slain ex-wife who wrote about brutal abuse that she suffered at his hands in the last weeks and days leading up to her murder. She would write in her diary that you hit her when it wasn't true? She never had a diary. Impeached by witnesses who came to the witness stand and testified to things that Simpson said or did. What was she saying? Uh, about how bad she felt and how OJ uh, hit her and that she wanted him to uh, pay for it. And of course, impeached by all of the forensic evidence. Was the blood found in the uh, Bronco at Rockingham your blood? I don't know and then ultimately impeached by photographs showing that he wore the shoes that the killer wore. Because I know if Bruno Magli makes shoes that look like the shoes they had in court that's involved in this case, I would have never worn those ugly ass shoes. O.J. Simpson was crumbling on the stand. When it got into the details, the blood, the cuts, the specifics, he was crumbling. I think I named uh, and labeled Dan's deposition outline early in the litigation as the initial ass kicking. And my recollection was I named his final closing argument the final ass kicking. And it really was. It felt like we kicked the defense's ass every step of the way. We got a call very late in the afternoon that the jury had reached a verdict. The judge did not want to hold a verdict over until the next day. And so everybody had to be corralled and gathered and, and marched on over to the courthouse. And by the time all that happened, it was like 6.30. And courts usually close at 4.35. There were just masses of people. And even though we were just across the street, we had to be escorted by police. And there were chants and demonstrators people saying Petrocelli for president, and people saying this is a crooked case, it's an illegal case, I mean, you know, on both sides. Certainly, we hope in every way possible that the jury was going to find him responsible and that they were going to see through all the lies and all the games and all the bullshit. We were sitting in the courthouse by then waiting, and the air conditioning was turned off because it automatically goes off in that courthouse. So it's getting hot and it's getting stuffy, and we're all jammed into the courtroom. And I remember how hot it was. And maybe I was just a lot hotter than the actual temperature. I was a nervous, nervous wreck at that point. It was almost like, do we want to hear it? Do we not want to hear it? But we were going to hear it no matter what. Everybody was on pins and needles. The jury funneled into the box, and Judge Fujisaki asked him, have you reached a verdict? The foreman said, we have, Your Honor. These moments are like etched in my memory forever. You don't have very many of them in your life when, you know, something is about to happen that you know is going to impact your life. But this was one of them. The jury found Orenthal James Simpson responsible. You could hear people breathing, you know, gasping. I think the emotions just exploded when we heard that they held him responsible. Then I started hearing sobbing of Kim and other family members. 
It was very emotional. My dad was doubled over crying. We were all holding something like each other. <laughs> it was outstanding, wonderful news. It was um, some verification of our wish for justice. After the verdict was announced, Simpson walked out of the courthouse showing little reaction, even when greeted by cat calls. When we exited the courtroom, when we opened up the door, there were just thousands of people standing there with cameras and cheering. Just cheering for us, and that was... I didn't expect that to be the scene. I had no idea what was going on out there. There were people that were just so proud and you could hear them yelling, you know, we support you, we love you, Goldman's, and that it was finally on the record. All that effort that we had put in, that it was finally written somewhere that he was responsible. And I wish a camera had been in the courtroom. I think the world needed to see O.J. Simpson on the stand. The world needed to see that a worshiped sports icon in fact was capable of brutally murdering two people. I'll never forget Fred raising his right arm with a fist punching and yelling victory. I'll never forget that I was standing right next to him and Dan. It was an unbelievable experience and it just was epically rewarding. We were victorious. We had gotten the court to acknowledge the killer had committed murder. He was responsible. I grabbed Dan by the shoulders and shook him. It was kind of like, my God, you see what we've done. Today's two and a half years, a little over two and a half years, and we finally have justice for Ron and Nicole. If it weren't for all these wonderful attorneys whose passion, whose belief, whose willingness to put in 24 hours a day for all this time is proof of the kind of people they are, and I think that's part of the reason why we're where we're at today. Our family is grateful for a verdict of responsibility, which is all we ever wanted. And we have it, thank God. Relief. Relief was the single most active emotion that I felt. Just relief that we had won this case for Fred and that all these expectations that were on us had been met. What an extraordinary honor and privilege it has been to represent this man and his family. They have conducted themselves with extraordinary grace and dignity throughout this entire unspeakable tragedy. And as I told Fred earlier, just a few moments ago, Ron would have been proud. Ron is think? proud. Ron is proud. We did this for Ron. I want okay, to go tell that's going to be it. Mr. Goldman, what's your reaction? Your reaction? Wonderful! I know I'm going to be Debbie Doomsday, but that moment didn't last forever because the killer left in the courtroom just like us and was driving around and went to have ice cream, and then he went about his life. And he was a free man still. It was bittersweet because Ron Goldman was dead. Nicole Brown Simpson was dead, and here we were celebrating. That judgment was a piece of paper, a piece of paper that's only as good as the paper it's written on, and that uh, the court offers you no assistance in getting, getting the judgment honored. And that's when we decided that we were going to continue to go after him for the rest of his life. Despite all of his wealth and luxury and privilege, he has not paid one dime. He has refused to honor this judgment, and we intend to enforce it. When he went to jail, I sent him a card that said, congratulations on your new home. And then on the inside, I wrote, um, I hope you enjoy your new digs, the Goldman family. My dad was very proud of me. 
At the end of the book that we wrote, uh, his name is Ron, we wrote the last chapter, and it reads, if I can get through it, to the psychopathic coward who murdered my son. The desire to confront you, to tell you exactly what I think of you, has simmered and burned in me since it became so obvious that you were guilty of taking away from me forever the opportunity to hug my son and share his life and laughter. You took from Ron the opportunity to have children and to be the most unbelievable, wonderful father this world could imagine. You took from Ron the opportunity to share the rest of his life with Kim, his sister. You took from Ron the love of Patty, more of a mother to him than he ever had before. You took from this earth the kind of man you never were, never have been, and never could be. There is nothing more to say. You are not worth any more of my words. You are not worth any more of my energy. You are not worth any more of my passion. You are not worthy to walk in Ron's sh shadow. I've forgotten that.